that he would not die. Chin rest is very important because that's going to decide where the head is in the slit lamp. I'll talk about that in a second, but everybody's head is a different size. Therefore, if their head is in a different place, that'll put their eyes in a different place. The eyes have to be around, about the right place in the slit lamp for your slit lamp to find them. And then again, there's the forehead pad at the top. You have to keep their head against the forehead pad so it doesn't move. Even the slightest bit of motion will take your subject out of focus. So if they're up against that plastic band, they won't be able to move their head. And then the beam height adjustments up here, this is what makes the beam get shorter and larger. I feel like the beam height adjustment is way, way more precise than the width adjustment. So if you were gonna measure something, what you would do is you would look through the slit lamp and get the beam to be the exact same size using 
the adjustment as the thing you're looking at, whatever it is, it's a scratch or a foreign body. Once you do that, if you look up here on the top, there's a little dial that tells you how many millimeters it is. All right, so that's how you measure things. The only problem is it's only an up and down measurement. If you actually grab the light source and twist it, you'll see that you can actually rotate the beam of light 90 degrees. So that's how you would measure in the other direction across, or if it's a, a scratch that goes diagonal, you can get the light beam to line up with the scratch diagonal and then measure it that way. So again, you use the base of the lamp to drive around and to get you your focus, all right? Um, we talked about the height and width ready. Measuring we talked about, and focus we kind of talked about already. So I think the most important thing is that you have to learn, if you're gonna learn any few things to start with, the lockdown is through because you won't be able to focus if that's not loose and it's not moving. The joystick, which is gonna again give you focus, and then spinning it will move you up or down so you can find the thing you're looking for. The beam width adjustment, the beam height adjustment, and the intensity knob control the light. So if you can learn those two things, the light and then the motion, that's really the hardest part about the cylinder. Then you just have to practice using it. So again, we talk about getting the head in the right place so you can find them. The lateral canvas of the eye should be equal with this black line on the side of the cylinder. Okay? The way you change it is there's a knob over here or a, uh, a grip over here that if you rotate it, it'll change where the chin lift, the chin sits. And that's how you're gonna move the head up or down so the lateral canvas of the eye lines up with this band that's right here. And it's really not super important to get it right exactly on, but it will make it helpful because you'll be able to get the head about in the right place so the still lamp can find the, find the uh, subject. So let's talk about focusing. Like I said before, the still lamp has a really set depth of focus. It never changes. You only move the still lamp to change focus. So if you're looking out here at the front of the cornea, you've got that in nice focus at this depth away. If you now want to look at something else that's farther forward, you're gonna to have to move the still lamp to get it in focus. So you're gonna move your still lamp to the left, and move it over there, but it's not gonna be in focus yet. Whatever amount of depth change, front back change, your subject has changed, the scope's gonna to have to change that much too. So as you're starting to look at things, if you look at the arc or the size of the curve of the thing you're looking at, you sort of should get used to moving it to the side and forward at the same time, so everything stays in focus and you keep, you're able to see what you're looking at. Does that make sense to everybody? Same thing with the light. Remember, the light is not coming directly from the front. The light swings from side to side. So if I'm looking at something on the front and the light's coming here from uh, my right, if I want to look at something on this side, I can leave the light where it is. However, if I want to go to the other side, you're going to see that the light is going to totally miss the subject on that side. So what you do is just swing the light across to the other side, and now you'll be able to see it. So if the light is on this side of the globe, it should come from this side. And if it's on this side of the globe, it should come from uh, the left side. All right, this is an important concept because if you don't switch where the light is, you won't be able to see anything. Or you just won't be able to see it well and it won't be in focus. All right, does anybody have any questions about that? And the light's really easy to swing. You just take it and give it a little push. And it should stay within 15 degrees of the center on either side. You really shouldn't go much farther than 15. Quick review of the parts of the eye. Again, the cornea is up front. You have your anterior chamber where stuff goes through next, the light goes through next. Then you have your sphincter of the pupillary muscle, attached to the pupillary muscles. All right. Canal of Schlem is right here behind the limbus, and that's where acute sumer grades out. You guys all remember that acute sumer is produced by the ciliary body, goes through the posterior chamber back here, comes through the pupil into the anterior chamber, and it dumps out the canal of Schlem. If any of these parts are blocked, you can get glaucoma, right? There are things called senechiae, which are like adhesions. If the iris gets stuck to the lens with a senechiae, or with multiple ones, your posterior chamber can build up pressure. Similarly, if you get anything in the anterior chamber, like let's say red or white blood cells, if they clog the canal of Schlem, 
you can get lack of egress out of the canal slim, you can get um, build pressure in the anterior chamber by blocking it there. And then of course back here is the vitreous, and then your retina is back in the back, with everything going out the back through the optic nerve. So when you do your slip lip exam, you want to start from the outside and work in. And if you look at any of the ophthalmologist consoles, they all go in this order also. So the first thing you look at, the most peripheral part of the eye, is what the ophthalmologists call LLL, or lids, lashes, and lacrimal apparatus. All right? So those are the things you're looking at. When you look at the lids, you're going to look for signs of swelling, you're going to look for trauma. You need to lift the lid and look for foreign body. It's super important. If a person gets a foreign body under their lid, Every time they blink, they're gonna drag that foreign body up and down on their cornea and cause more and more problems. We'll see an example of that in a minute. When you're looking at the lashes, make sure the glands aren't blocked, make sure the glands aren't infected. There are some bugs that like to attach themselves to, to eyelashes. Definitely a gross thing to find. You'll be surprised how many people have them. And then antral we'll glands we'll look at in a second. And the last thing is the lacrimal apparatus. The lacrimal glands are on the temporal sides of your head and they dump uh, they dump tears into your eye, which cross the eye, get down to the puncta, and drain out through the nose. So here's what happens when you don't flip the, when you do flip the eyelid. Nice big foreign body under there, piece of rust, all right? And you can see if you were to blink, every time your lid goes up and down, you would drag that piece of rust over the cornea, and you would get this, all right? They call this a skating rink sign, because it looks like people are ice skating on fresh ice, it just goes around and around and around. Really, really bad injury to have because instead of having one little scratch, now you have multiple, multiple scratches. All right? This is what happens when the ducts of your eyelashes get blocked. You get what's called a schlesium. All right? The outside gets blocked. It keeps producing material. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Unfortunately, sometimes it gets infected. When you have infection in a closed space, it leads to an abscess. Kind of painful, kind of hard to get rid of. You need to give them hot soaks for at least a couple days. Trying to drain all that junk out. Gentle massage also helps. So we've talked about tropion before. And tropion is when your lashes point in the wrong direction. All right? What happens is your lid um, structure changes. It's often due to an infection of chlamydia. And repeated infections cause the lid to scar and get tighter and roll inwards. It's not such a big deal if the lashes kind of point up or even point in a little bit. But if the lashes point totally in towards your eye, every time you blink, you're gonna rub off your corneal epithelium. And that's how you go blind from trachomonas. Sorry, just to be clear, this isn't chlamydial conjunctivitis or any? No, chlamydial conjunctivitis. Don't worry, God, you're safe. <laughs> For now. All right, so every time you get an infection or if the infection persists, you get more and more scarring of the eyelid and the lashes will roll inwards eventually, okay? It's actually normal to have entropion in the medial cantus. And if you guys have done the still enough exam with me, we always look for that to see if it's there in everybody. And I would say in 98% of the people I've looked at, they do have eyelashes pointing inward in the medial cantus. Some of them are even impaling the conjunctiva and go through the conjunctiva, which is a source of red eyes in a lot of people. If you're constantly being poked in the conjunctiva with an eyelash, it's very, very irritating, very, very annoying. All right, this person with entropion, you can see that all the lashes are pointing inwards up here on the eyelid. Here's that picture of the bugs on your eyelid, all right? These are uh, tiny mites, some of them sometimes are bed bugs. You can see also that all their eggs are laid on the eyelashes and stay there. And then the big bugs, kind of gross, I know it's early in the morning. Here's a good picture of the puncta. This person has a probe in there to see if it goes all the way through to the nose, if it's complete. If you block the puncta, your tears have no place to go, right? They're coming from the glands on the temporal sides, and they go nasally and they drain out the puncta, which goes into the lacrimal duct. If you block that, the tears have to go someplace. So what's gonna happen is you're just gonna overflow your eyes and leak out over your face, all right? That's called epiphora. When the duct gets blocked or if the duct gets cut and injured, the tears are gonna drain out over your face, and that's called epiphora. Here's a person who doesn't have an intact duct. Right? The ophthalmologists all have this little probe that they can put in the puncta to see if the duct is injured when you get facial trauma. Right? This one, obviously, the puncta is here, and the other side of the duct is here, which is not attached to where it should be. It's coming out. 
Right, the sclera is the white part of the eye. We're moving more medial, more towards the middle of the eye. Right, the sclera goes all the way around your eyeballs, even in the back. And there are vessels that are in the sclera, but there are also vessels that are in the conjunctiva. And if you have a good focus on the slit lamp, you can actually see the difference in depth. Right, this can tell, this is good for your 3D view. It's good practice to tell if you have good, good focus. You're looking for lacerations of the sclera, injection, subconjunctival hemorrhage, and then there are two pathologies you know that occur on the sclera. There are your pinguecula and pterygiums. So here's a nice picture of your sclera. And you can see that like this vessel here, very superficial. This one here, very superficial. But these down here, very deep. Alright? This one, very deep. So the epispelar vessels that are in the conjunctiva are these superficial ones. The scleral vessels are these deep ones. Those are down deep in the scleral. And another way to tell them apart is take your finger and put it on the person's eyelid. Take your head out of the scope when you're doing this. You don't poke them in the eye. Look to see where their eyelid is. Put your finger on their eyelid and then look back in the scope and gently touch the eyelid, move it up and down. And you'll see that the epispelar vessels that are in the conjunctiva will actually move, while the scleral vessels are fixed and don't move. So here's the person with a scleral rupture. This guy actually was really kind of interesting. It was uh, winter time, and he was trying to put the club on his car, but it froze. So he's pulling and pulling, and he pulled like this. He smacked himself right in the eye when he gave. So he's actually ruptured his sclera. Right? These are not episcleral vessels. This is not in the conjunctiva. This is actually tears in your sclera and bleeding in the sclera. Right? Very, very different from subconscious hematoma. Very, very different. Treat it different. It's got to go to the OR and get it fixed. It's got to put stitches in it. Here's a nice subconscious hematoma. Notice it goes all the way around the eye. It's the same depth, and it goes right up to the limbus and stops. Right, your conjunctiva does not go over your cornea. That's where the conjunctiva stops. So that's where the subconscious memory stops also. Are those the epispheral vessels that are Usually, yeah. I mean, if a scleral vessel ruptures, it can bleed outwards, but it'll appear deeper if you can see through it. Depends how thick it is. Here's a kinguecula. Right? This is like a heaped up amount of soft tissue, but it doesn't cross the limbus. It doesn't go onto the cornea. While a pterygium, similar, but actually crosses the limbus and encroaches onto the cornea. These really don't cause too much trouble until they get into your optic axis. If they're in the optic axis and you can't see through it, then it's going to affect your vision. So the limbus we just talked about, the limbus is a dividing line between the sclera and the cornea. It's kind of a cloudy, wispy looking area, and there's a lot of stuff in there or underneath there that's important, right? Your corneal nerves all originate from there, and the canal of slim is down, but down beneath it. The angle at the limbus is also very important. We're gonna talk about that in a second. So here's a nice picture of the corneal nerves, right? They're these little white hair-like projections that are all radially oriented from the limbus inward, inwards towards the middle. And if you put the scope on high power, you should be able to see that. If you shine the slit lamp light directly on the cornea, it's usually going to be too bright and you won't see them. What you need to do is shine the slit lamp light outside the limbus onto the white part of the eye, onto the sclera, and then look inside the limbus. And that little bit of light that's being reflected off the white part, you'll be able to see. So here's the angle I was talking about before. A normal person's angle between the iris and the cornea is 45 degrees. However, however, either congenitally or if you have problems, the angle can close down. A person with 20 degrees probably won't have any trouble. They'll probably still be able to drain aqueous humor out of their angio chamber. However, if you get down real tight, down to 10 degrees, you can see that there's really not very much room there. Maybe just enough so aqueous humor can sneak out. If I now put you, say, in a movie theater where it's dark, your iris needs to open up and it needs to let a lot more light hit your retina. When your iris opens up, all that tissue kind of bunches up in the back. And this is where it bunches up, back here in the corner. So while you barely had enough room before, now you don't have enough room, aqueous humor can't get out, and you end up with narrow, narrow angled glaucoma. That make sense to everybody? So whenever you're taking a test, if the test starts out, the person's in a movie theater and gets eye pain, it's always gonna be narrow, hour, narrow angled glaucoma. Right, 100% of the time. I've never seen any other question on the in-service on the boards 
that relates to now how it become other than they're in a movie theater. So now to move more medial, moving towards the cornea and the center of the eye, right? The surface of the cornea kind of looks like the surface of the moon. It's very bumpy, very irregular. It has a very, very shiny tear film on it. And if you live in a city or if you live any place where there's dust, which is everywhere, <coughs> you get dust in the tear film and you can actually see the dust moving around on the eye if you pay attention to it, if you have good focus, okay? When you examine their cornea, you're looking for defects, you're looking for abrasions, you're looking for foreign bodies, ulcers, perforations. You want to make sure that the cornea is intact. And if you get good at getting focus and you get a nice thin beam on the bottom second, you can actually see the thickness of the cornea and you can tell if they're thickened or not. So here's a person with a scratch on the cornea. This person's already been stained to make it look better. But this person was uh, fighting with their, one of their friends and the other person dragged their fingernail across their cornea and took off the big hunter. Okay? Here we have, there's fluorescein, the place to talk about fluorescein in a minute, but it just made it easier to see. Here's a person with a foreign body, right? This is an iron foreign body that started to rust. And so it starts to cause a ton of edema in the cornea, right? And here's another piece of rust that's still in there. If this might have been right after they took it out and it left the rust ring, but the iron is not sitting over here, all right? But a huge amount of edema and a rust ring is, you can't see through it. So you actually have to pull that rust ring out. You can do it a few different ways. You can use a syringe, or I'm sorry, a needle, like a TV syringe with a very fine 27 gauge needle. Or they have a thing called bird drills. Um, it's a little drill that spins and has a burr at the end. And you just gently touch it to the rust ring and it scrapes it off. Remember, your cornea is really, really, really thin. So if you're going to do this, you have to be super careful you don't perforate the cornea. Here's another farm body we saw about two years ago. Kid was riding his bicycle and a piece of wire just kind of bounced up from the road, hit him square in the eye, and is now impaled into his cornea. Kind of a good photo off of this kid. There's a person with an ulcer, all right? It looks a little different from the scratch. And actually, if you look at it on the slit lamp, you'll see that it has depth to it. It actually goes down into the cornea. These are really an ocular emergency. They need to be treated. It mostly happens to people who wear contact lenses, but it can happen to others also. But as it gets deeper and deeper and deeper, if it erodes into your anterior chamber, you're gonna end up with a leak. And then your anterior chamber is gonna be contaminated and you're really in a lot of trouble. It can be really subtle, all right? This looks like it's just a reflection off the still lamp. This is the still lamp lightning. But they can be really, really subtle and really small. You have to make sure you don't miss these. All right, I currently kind of advise two different lawyers about eye cases, because they keep calling me about this stuff because I have a thing published online. Both eye cases are missed erosions, all right? Missed ulcers. So if you don't want to get sued, don't miss the ulcer. This is actually a cool shot. It's the only one I can find ever on this. This is a person who has a corneal perforation, all right? It's right here. And what happens is they stay in the eye, but because the aqueous humor is leaking out of this hole, it's dripping down, and there's no fluorescein in that fresh aqueous humor that's leaking out, all right? This is called Zydelsa. Well, you can actually see the clear aqueous humor leaking through the fluorescein tear film. Right? So you definitely, definitely don't want to miss this. These guys got to get super strong antibiotics. They have to be seen by ophthalmology that night. You should never send them home with follow up in the morning. They have to be seen that night. All right, so now we'll get the cornea. We have a really, really thin, super thin beam of light hitting the cornea, right? It's only micron steady. Right here, is the outside of the cornea and the outside of the light beam where it goes through. Right here is the back of the cornea and the inside. So this distance right here is actually the thickness of the cornea. Once you've looked at a couple hundred of these, you'll get a feeling of what normal is and you'll be able to tell if you have corneal edema. But you have to make the beam very, very super thin, only microns of light thin. All right, here's another view of it. Again, the outside of the cornea is here inside of the cornea is here, and this is the thickness. Notice too that this beam of light looks curved. That's because it's getting a curved surface. If I take a straight beam of light and hit a curved surface with it, the beam of light is gonna be, be bent, the surface is bent. This is a really important concept I'm gonna talk about in a couple minutes, but you need to remember that. Notice too that this person has all blood down here in the bottom of their eye, all right, that's called a hypema. If you get really good, and you can look at a high magnification, you can 
can actually tell the different layers of the cornea. Um, I'll let you guys look this up and see which layers are which, but if you get really good focus, you can actually see the different layers. All right, so now we move more towards the center, more into the anterior chamber. And this is where you're gonna see cells in flare. All right, where people have edema of their eye, or they have inflammation, they get white cells floating around in the anterior chamber. If the white cells build up so much and they layer out and sit at the bottom, that's called the hypopion. And if the red cells layer out at the bottom, that's called the hypebeam. So here's how you look for cells in flare. You make the beam as small of a square as you can get. And that's gonna be two millimeters top to bottom, and probably one millimeter side to side. That's the tiniest you beam you get, and you can still see it. All right? So you make your beam really, really tiny. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna focus on the cornea, and then focus on the iris. Cornea, iris, cornea, iris, and then move forward to stop someplace in the middle. At that point, you know you're focusing on the anterior chamber. And what you're looking for is little tiny spots, like these, all right? The cells are really, really incredibly small, obviously they're cells, but you're really gonna have to strain your eyes to see them on high power. But what you're gonna do is, you're gonna put the beam of light there, coming in from like 15 to 30 degrees from the side, and you're just gonna sit and wait. Wait like a minute, 90 seconds, and you're gonna watch for cells to kind of float through the beam of light. What they say it looks like is dust going through the projector in a movie screen or a movie theater, but you're gonna sit and wait for at least 30 seconds to see if there are cells there, all right? And then this foggy appearance, kind of like this, that's flare, that's protein in the anterior chamber, also due to inflammation, all right? So the protein is the flare, and the cells are the little specks that you see going through it. So here's a hypopion. All these cells are in the anterior chamber, and they start to layer out and fall down to the bottom. Similarly, red cells can layer out and sit down at the bottom. All right? If they sit there long enough, they'll clot and form a nice blood clot down there. So if you move the head, they shouldn't get stirred up. They shouldn't float back up into your field of vision. Here's a little bigger one of fresh blood. You can see there's a nice flat level here. And then if you get really bad ones, you can get the whole entire anterior chamber filled with blood. They call that an eight ball because it looks like a cue ball. Right? But the whole entire eye, or the whole entire anterior chamber, is filled with blood. Remember before we talked about the canal of Schlem, if all these red cells clot in the canal of Schlem, you're not going to have any outflow of aqueous humor, and you end up with a All right, we move more forwards now into the middle. The iris is the colorful part of the eye. There are all these fibers arranged either circular or longitudinally. The circular fibers, when they contract, they make your pupil smaller. The longitudinal fibers, when they contract, they make the pupil bigger and they let in more light. So one of the things you can do to see the different uh, configurations of the pupil is to put the light, your light source, on the outside, on the uh, edge of the iris, and then drive your light into the middle and put it through the pupil so it hits the retina, and everything should get really, really much tighter very quickly. And you'll see the muscles change configuration. Things you're looking for here, you're looking for defects, you're looking for iris bombe, which is bending of the iris, and then you're looking for senecia, which are like kind of adhesions. Here's a nice picture of an iris. You can see all the fibers kind of going somewhere around and going in circles, and then some are in and out. Um, most of the patients that we're going to see have dark colored eyes, so it makes it easy to see white cells in the anterior chamber. You have that nice brown background, and you know that the white cells are going to fall down to the bottom. So when you're looking for white cells in the anterior chamber, kind of use the bottom of the iris as your background. However, in people with light colored eyes, it's really difficult to see white cells floating around. So then what you want to do is you want to use the pupil as your backdrop and shoot through that because it's dark colored or black, so you will be able to see the cells a lot, lot better. All right? Realize that it's a lot harder to lead your light focus there because it's hitting the retina and it's very irritating. So try and do it quick when you're looking through the pupil, but you have no choice because you won't be able to see it against the light color background. All right, notice too that there are some different colors, uh, some have orange and red. You can definitely see it around the edge of the pupil where they have different color or crack, uh, pieces there. So here's a person with a defect in their iris, right? Remember before we talked about a straight beam of light should be straight on a flat surface. But this beam of light curves and comes up here and it goes back down. This person has a weak spot or a defect in their iris, it's being bowed outwards and it's kind of like a dome. 
So when you drive your nice flat beam of light over it, it's going to look bent. Not so big a deal for outflow of aqueous humor because it's only focal. It's only in one spot. You have the whole rest of the eye to have egress of aqueous fluid. However, this person, you can see that the beam of light is bent the whole way around. Right? This is what's called an iris bombe. Usually what happens is you have sinitiae or adhesions between the iris and the lens. And that blocks the flow of aqueous fluid out of the posterior chamber. And that causes your iris to bend outwards. Not so big a deal, except for the fact that now you've gotten your angle really narrowed down. So you have fluid stuck in the posterior chamber, and now you're getting fluid stuck in the anterior chamber, all not able to drain at all. So you're going to end up with much, much worse uh, ocular hypertension than before. Here's a nice picture of an anterior ceniche, right? Ceniche are adhesions or uh, fibers. Sometimes they can run all the way across the iris. If they're small like this one, they really don't cause a problem because you can't focus that close anyway. But as they get bigger and uh, move around, they must make cause problems with your vision. So now as we get to the pupil, the pupil is the aperture that lets light into the retina. And it's gonna change in size as we talked about before. It should be round in most people. Some people can have congenitally um, People that are out of shape, that could be tear shaped or even clover shaped, all these different shapes and sizes. But for the most part, they should be round. If it's not round, you should really think they have an eye in it. Right? Your lens sits behind your eye, your lens is the clear thing that you look through that focuses light on your retina, and the lens changes shape. Remember, we talked about the ciliary body and the ciliary process before? All right? The ciliary body actually pulls on the lens and pulls it out or releases and lets it get together change the conformation of the lens. And that's how you focus light on your retina. You can have lens dislocations and then cataracts as well. So here's a person that has a regularly shaped pupil. Right? You can see that they're being dragged out on this side. You can also see that they have a cut in their cornea and their pupil is actually coming through their cornea in one spot. But anytime you see a person whose pupil is not round, you should really think they have an eye injury. Something is deforming it and something is moving it. Here's cataracts, all right? This is a beam of light that's this wide. Here's the beam hitting the cornea. Here's the beam hitting the lens. And you can see that the lens of the eye is very irregularly shaped, almost again like the surface of the moon. But here is the light going through the lens. And you can see it's all yellow and green because they have a cataract, right? Your lens should be clear, but when there's colored stuff in there and solid stuff, that's what a cataract is. And if it gets bad enough, it's gonna make it so you can't see you're gonna lose So let's talk about fluorescein staining. I've seen a lot of different people do it different ways. There is a preferred way, and then there are other ways, and then there are wrong ways. I would prefer for you guys to do it the preferred way, but as long as you do it a correct way and not the other ways, I guess I'm okay with it. All right? So what you want to do is you want to anesthetize the eye, put a drop of catch in there, numb them up. You'll then take one drop of catch cane, and touch the tip of the fluorescein paper. Remember, fluorescein paper is very special paper. It's lint-free, so you don't leave anything in the eye. You shouldn't be touching the eye with pretty much anything else. Even Q-tips can leave pieces of Q-tip in the eye, not great for the eye. So you put one drip of um, tetracaine on the tip of the fluorescein stick. You pull the lower lid down, and you touch the lower lid. Right? The lower lid should have a nice pool of tears in there also, which should help the fluorescein dissolve. And then when they blink, they're going to blink and watch the fluorescein up over the cornea. Just a little piece of information for you. I'm sure you guys are all very interested in this. Fluorescein is very positively charged. Your eye basement membrane, like all basement membranes, is very negatively charged. Your corneal epithelium is neutral. If your corneal epithelium is intact, the fluorescein won't stick to it. If I scrape off your corneal epithelium and I expose that really negative basement membrane, then the fluorescein sticks and that's why it holds there and then fluorescein fluoresces no matter where it is. So here's the correct way to do it. You put one drop of fluorescein on the tip of the paper, and then you touch the bottom of the eyelid, or the inside of the eyelid. Hopefully there's a nice big pool of tears in there, and then when they blink, it'll drag it over the eye. Here's a person with a nice long linear scratch. All right, again, the cornea epithelium is scratched off, the fluorescein sticks to the basement membrane, and then when you shine a 
um, blue light on there, it fluoresces. Remember, you have to use the cobalt blue light on this lamp. Our handheld ophthalmoscopes don't have a blue light, they have a green light. It's meant for other dyes. It really won't fluoresce with fluorescein. So if you're gonna look at a person's eye with a handheld ophthalmoscope, it's not gonna fluoresce and you're gonna miss injuries. All right, the woods lamp actually is a cobalt blue light, you can use that one. And it has a nice magnifying lens also. But if you use the handheld ophthalmoscope, you're gonna miss that. All right, here's another person with fluorescein uptake, but this is not linear, this is not anything distinct. This is called SPK, or superficial punctate keratitis. What happens is this person got irritated by something and kept rubbing their eyes, rubbing their eyes, rubbing their eyes. And they rubbed off the coin epithelium in thousands of little spots. All right, so all the uptake is all over the eye. If you were to see the same pattern, but it stopped here and here, so only the middle part had it, that's probably due to sunburn on the eyes. That's UV keratitis. So the part of the cornea that's covered by the, by the uh, lids didn't get burnt, but the middle part did. So you'll see this uptake all across the middle, but you won't see it up here and down here. And of course, this is the one you guys are all looking for, you're all hoping to see, that you all don't want to miss. Right, this is the dendritic pattern of herpes. All right, I've been working for 22 years in the ER. I've seen it once. Hard to see, hard to pick up. Even people who have eye infections don't often get this dendritic pattern. Here's what you should not do, all right? You should not touch the fluorescein strip to the cornea. The fluorescein is so concentrated on the strip, it'll actually burn the cornea. So you don't want to give them a chemical burn on their cornea. You should also not put the stick under the eyelid, let it close and leave it there, and then take it out. All right, that's also not a good idea. Don't joke, I've seen people do it. I walk in the room and they have me like, oh, it's ready. And I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> do not drip drops of uh, tetracaine or normal saline down the strip into the eye. Right? That's way too much fluorescein. You're not going to see anything. Right? Don't put too much in. So here's what it looks like when you put the stick on the cornea. Right? You can see the actual outline of the stick <coughs> on the cornea. Alright? Don't injure your patients. Do no harm. The first thing that you signed when you were a doctor, the first thing you said you wouldn't do. Do no harm. Here's a person who put like four or five drops of tetracaine on the stick and dropped it in. The whole entire eye is green. You can't tell if there's a scratch under there. Right? You also have a nice big bubble where it dropped and landed and made a bubble. Right? So you don't want to do that. <laughs> but way too much fluorescein. Right? The way to fix this is take six to eight drops of normal saline and just drop it into the eye. And what it'll do is it'll wash out all the fluorescein either down the canal shen or over the eye, like it's doing here, and it'll, drop, it'll wash that. All right, so you'll get much less fluorescein in there. And then look at them with the blue light to see if you can see anything. But if you look at the blue light here, the whole entire eye is going to fluoresce. You won't be able to tell if they have an injury down there. Also, don't get fooled by a person who's totally rubbed off their cornea. I've seen it two or three times now. There's something called chronic corneal lotion syndrome. People who don't make a lot of tears, their eyes get very dry, especially when they sleep. And people who get startled awake open their eyes very quickly, and the cornea stick to the back of the lid. When they open their eye, they rip off the whole entire cornea of the field. So when you stain them, the whole entire eye is going to be green. So you may think, oh, that's just normal, but if they're having a lot of pain and it hasn't been done it before, don't miss corneal avulsion syndrome when you rip off the whole entire cornea. All right, so let's move on to the ophthalmology consults now. I try to get the ophthalmologist to tell me everything they use abbreviations for. It's about 14 pages long. No, I'm just kidding. I think it's three or four. It's not so bad. But OT and OS are left and right. Um, OS is left. Do you guys know where that came from? Yeah, yeah people who are left-handed think it's supposed to be sinister. And that comes from the time when people carried around swords and defended themselves. Because a left-handed guy, he could shake your hand conventionally right-handed and then pull a sword out and kill you. So those guys are obviously sinister. OU means both eyes. Um, SLE is the split limb exam. LLL, we talked about before, as lids, lashes, and lacrimal apparatus. I've seen LLA also, which is just lids, lashes, and apparatus. CS is conjunctiva and sclera. K is for cornea. They did that just because it had to be different from C. 
AC is your anterior chamber, I and P is your iris and pupil, and L is lamina. When you see the console, it's actually going to be listed in this order. And notice that's the same order we talked about, going from outside towards the center. So if you don't remember what something stands for, you can kind of figure it out by seeing where it is in the progression. DFB is the dilated fundoscopic exam. Remember, your slit lamp has a very set focal depth or a focal area, and you can't focus any place beyond that. If you drive the slit lamp all the way forward, you still really can't get past the lens. You also hit them in the nose, but you really can't get the slit lamp to focus past the lens of their eye. The only way to see deeper is to change the optics of the slit lamp. And the way to do that is you buy a $300 lens that the ophthalmologists have and you hold it in between the light and the eye, and that changes where you focus. And they can actually see the back of the eye with that lens. But you won't be able to get past the uh, person's lens unless you have that other glass interposed lens to see back there. All right? Uh, B is vitreous. CD is the cup to disc ratio of the optic nerve. M is your macula. And VP is the vessels in the periphery of your retina. POA just has ocular history, and T pen is your tonal pen measurement of your intraocular pressure. NVA and DVA are your near and distal distant visual acuities, and SC and CC is with and without correction, right? Sans correction and with correction. So I know it's a little bit fast, but do any of you guys have any questions? Uh, sometimes you see pupils that. So again, surgery is an injury, it's just an old injury. So if you don't see a round pupil, you need to just be suspicious of an injury. If you ask them, have you ever had your cataracts taken out, and they say yes, well then it may be due to that. But if you see a pupil that's not round, you have to be suspicious of an injury. Because if they say, I haven't had cataracts, now what caused it to be out of round? But you're right, when they put in new lenses, when they take out cataracts and put in a fake lens, they do often make the pupil irregular. because then their cornea is going to get dried out and you're going to cause more problems. Um, if the two ways to get it out are use normal saline, like one of the, uh, the little pink bullets, or use a syringe and try and wash it out. They usually come out that way. It's very rare for a firm body to get impaled into the eyelid. Most of them get impaled onto the cornea. If that doesn't work, I would just take a Q-tip and swab it off. You get into trouble when it's actually in the cornea and adhered to the cornea and stuck in the cornea with edema and rust formation. Those are really hard to get out. And those probably gonna need a 27 gauge needle on syringe to actually pull it out, <laughs> scrape it out, and dig out that rust ring from the corner. Any other questions? All right, thank you guys for listening. <laughs> Another thing, by the way, there's no substitute for practice. You guys have to use the still have practice out of it. So every patient with an eye problem, you should be looking at, all right? If your attendees don't want to help you, as a senior resident, most of those guys are able to do it. I think only a few attendees don't do them now, but the problem is the attendees are just busy, or lazy, one of the two. So just ask them to help you. If you ask them, I doubt they're going to turn you down. But if you tell them, ah, I really don't want to do it, do I really need to, they're going to say, no, go see more patients. So tell them you want to do it. Don't, don't pass up doing it because you won't get practice otherwise. Just a quick minute to stretch, guys.